So uh, let's move on to the last item uh, with uh, Professor uh, Longrois. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Guinot. It's uh, an honor to be here with you. I would like to, s to thank uh, the SFAR organizers for this invitation. So now, we if I were to summarize the, the previous presentations, so minatil pressure targets to avoid hypertension. Second and the third speakers have insisted on the necessity of monitoring hemodynamics more or less routinely. And the question that I would like to address, whether even more sophisticated tools, such as the closed loops, uh, assistance software and predictive tools, uh, are they uh, uh, useful or just futile? So uh, this is the uh, conflict of interest. I've worked and continue to work with major companies involved in hemodynamic monitoring, but my academic credo is that the what limits our performances and what limits uh, the way we monitor is not the technology, it's the way we interpret it. So the first conceptual uh, um, element that I would like to discuss with you is about what I call this the virtuous circle of hemodynamic monitoring, but it can apply to any type of monitoring. So you, what you like is uh, a cardiovascular parameter, okay? And in general, this cardiovascular parameter, you have some physiological knowledge about what it means for the cardiovascular well-being, and you get a signal. From the signal, you've seen signals here, it's arterial uh, blood pressure, for instance, you get a numerical value. And then you as a clinician, and basically no uh, artificial intelligence can do this for the moment, actually cross-validates the signal and the numerical value. So when you decide that you will put a closed loop on a numerical value, you need to be sure that your signal actually validates the numerical value and vice versa. Once you have done this, you have to interpret. Is this hypotension? Is this hypertension? So you've seen the difficulties in interpretation. And then you need to classify. So it can be abnormal but expected, and you would not classify this as uh, pathologic, because you understand what's going on. Okay? Further, you have to decide on an intervention, and then you need to look at the evaluation of the effectiveness of the intervention. Now, in um, most of the literature, what you have seen is if I measure blood pressure continuously, do I get better outcome? So we have kind of provided shortcuts to this complex clinical reasoning, which, which is probably a mistake. Now, the second uh, part of my conceptual framework is why do we monitor? So um, it looks trivial, but there, when you look in the literature, there have been very few definitions of the goals of monitoring. So the first goal is to detect that the parameter has deviated from the target or expected value. I call this the alarm function of monitoring. And in this respect, faster detection is better. It's a clinical benefit, of course. And then, in this case, prediction, I will briefly come to this, which is a wrong term, because actually there's no prediction. The monitors that are available on the market, actually what they do, they detect the uh, activation of compensatory mechanism when a hemodynamic challenge occurs. So there's no prediction in it. It's just a measurement of an, uh, a less than clinically available uh, signal. And then the second element which has been put forward by the previous speakers is that you need to identify the possible causes and mechanism of deviation. And without identifying the mechanism and causes of deviation, all your reasoning on the alarm function is actually amputated by a large part of its uh, 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 information. So stroke volume decreases following peritoneal insufflation and the patient becomes preload dependent because of the increase in intra-abdominal pressure. No monitor, no artificial intelligence will give you this information. It is only us, the clinicians, who can provide this information and do this interpretation. So if you correct the deviation of a parameter that is of interest for you, arterial blood pressure here, without it going through the mechanism and causes, it's a shortcut, once again, that is possibly dangerous. So if the, the, your, your, our parameter of interest is arterial blood pressure, what is the accuracy? So there's a very, very large amount of literature on this. But basically, everybody imagines that invasive blood pressure uh, monitoring is reliable and accurate, and this is not the case because it's supposed to reflect the central blood pressure, and this is absolutely not the case because you have an amplification of the systolic and possibly, but not documented, decrease in the diastolic with an increase of the pulse pressure from the uh, aorta to the periphery, that is the radial uh, uh, artery. 
and the map values should be constant except if you have a low cardiac output, whatever the mechanism. So if you put a closed loop on a given value of map, okay, you basically, which is taken from the radial artery, you have no information about what happens in the central uh, 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 circulation. And uh, it has been discussed, so in practice, if you do invasive arterial blood pressure measurements, the systolic and the diastolic are measured, and the mean arterial pressure is calculated. If you do oscillometry, non-invasive blood pressure, this is the, the, the most common uh, method of measuring arterial blood pressure in the OR, the MAP is measured and the systolic and diastolic are interpolated, they are not measured. Okay? And the most robust value between the oscillometry measured mean arterial blood pressure and the calculated map pressure, when you ask the question, everybody would answer, is the invasive, which is absolutely not the case, because the answer is the most robust information is the oscillometry measured mean arterial pressure. And when you look at the differences in the literature between differences between the oscillometry map and the calculated invasive artery pressure map, well, MAP measured is a better and more robust signal. And therefore, the quality of the signal that you get once you put a closed loop on will make a difference. And even for a simple parameter such as arterial blood pressure, there's noise in measurement. So the noise is 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury in the MAP. And it is not constant for a given patient. So if you actually decide that 64 millimeters of MAP is hypotension and 66 is not hypotension, it is conceptually and technically wrong, okay? So whatever method, a closed loop or a continuous infusion targeting a given value of MAP is conceptually unstable. So uh, can one predict intraop hypotension? Very, very few words. So I don't like the term prediction and I, I have interacted with Edwards. Uh, actually what they did they were able to identify changes in the arterial blood pressure curve that actually document activation of the compensatory mechanism once a challenge occurs. And hypotension, whatever the mechanism, is a challenge for the uh, hemodynamic system because you activate the baroreceptors, low pressure and high pressure. And what they did here is actually they came from a situation where you in regular clinical practice, you get from stability, my map is between my targets, and then it goes to unstable, the map has gone below my target, to a situation where they detect early instability. And now the question, can we detect early instability without their tools? The answer is, of course, yes, you need to look at the trends. The problem is that what they did, actually, they amplify their signal, and it's not a scale of five or six bits per minute, it's a scale that's from zero to 100, so they amplified the signal looking at the prediction of hypotension by measuring the onset of compensatory mechanism once a challenge such as arterial hypotension uh, occurs. So I don't have the time to go with you through the uh, initial data showing that there's clinical relevance into this index of prediction hypotension, but my message is be ready for such technology and be able to um, understand how it was uh, actually implemented and what are the limitations. And I think this is going to be the future of monitoring in general. So it has been discussed uh, already previously. Once you go to the hypertension, you should look at the correlates, which are stroke volume and stroke volume variation. And this is a, a typical example that was monitored in one of the hospitals where I work. So what we do is we, we choose to work only with stroke volume. We don't work with cardiac output for many reasons. So it's only stroke volume. And what you can see here is that there are changes in the map which are quite impressive and they are actually associated with a nearly constant stroke volume. And what you see here is the hypotension prediction index. And it, as I showed you, it is very, very widely amplified so that once it gets 40% to 80%, you actually have a few minutes or dozens of seconds because you see it. Now, will this change outcome? I do not know, but I can tell you that, it, it, that many, many times the hypotension prediction index goes up. We look at the screen, we don't understand, and within the dozens of seconds that will follow, we see why it changed. Is it perfect? I don't know. And then 
as you can see here, we also look at the tolerance of atelial hypotension by measuring the uh, frontal cerebral nias, and we do this by having those electrodes of nias, and actually it informs us whether the hypotension is tolerated by the, pati by the patient uh, or not. So for our previous slides, I think it is obvious that the same, a similar level of mean arterial pressure is associated with very dissimilar or strikingly different uh, correlates of stroke volume, and therefore only looking at the map can actually take us to a dangerous uh, situation. So this has been defined, and exactly what I said, you need to define what is intraop hypertension, and you have to set the thresholds. The mechanisms are important. One of the most frequent is a decrease in vascular tone, and this is why I told you that I consider that the measuring of anesthetic depth is actually uh, an important issue in, in avoiding overdose. And then uh, it, uh, looking at preload dependency or no has already been discussed. And once we have analyzed those parameters, you can choose the vasoconstrictor. And I agree with the previous speakers that one should be very, very cautious when uh, giving alpha-1 agonists, pure alpha-1 agonists such as felidephrin allow. So my interpretation I against is quote-unquote, I'm not against uh, uh, closed loops and I'm not against uh, fancy technological approaches. But let me just remind you that even a signal sample such as a tilt pressure is actually very complex and you need to consider noise when you go from uh, cohorts to decision making for individual patients. This is absolutely necessary. It is possible to detect activation of confirmatory mechanism through this hypotension prediction index. I, I hate the term prediction because it will take clinicians on, on, on prediction and not on physiology. The hemodynamic correlates, and I insist on the stroke volume, are very, very different for a similar pressure of arterial pressure, and therefore one should not treat arterial pressure unless the situations are very simple without considering the, the interpretation and classification, and this is strictly necessary. And if an arterial pressure closed loop takes into consideration the other hemodynamic correlates, which is technically very difficult, I say, why not? And if it only looks at the arterial pressure signal, I say, attention, this could be dangerous. Thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Professor Longroa. Um.